You gotta wake up to a world that's real. You gotta rise up and make it feel. Life in full measure is more than just pleasure. Wake up and live. You gotta wake up to a world in need. You gotta get up and begin to lead. A life in full measure is more than just pleasure. Hello and welcome. Today is Thursday, March the 6th, 2014. This is Paul Sandhu coming to you with another episode of Wake Up and Live Radio. Today it is my pleasure to be speaking with uh, Eric John Phelps, author of Vatican Assassins. Eric is a, a writer, a radio show host, a researcher, and a historian. I first encountered Eric's works about, uh, I would say, 12 or 13 years ago, and uh, he has really been instrumental in opening my eyes up to who sits atop the pyramid of evil in this world. Hi, Paul. Oh. Pleasure to be with you. Okay, great. It's a pleasure having you on here. Uh, like I was just uh, telling our audience in the, in the introduction that I first uh, heard, uh, I believe the first time I heard you was on Jeff Rents, and I don't know, that must have been somewhere around 2001, maybe 2002. Yeah. And, and uh, then, uh, of course, you had a conference here in Toronto, and uh, I had uh, the uh, pleasure of attending that and uh, picked up your uh, Vatican Assassin's book which has been really, really an eye-opener for me as to the power of the Vatican and Rome in world affairs, not just in modern times, but going back through history for possibly for a couple thousand years. So that is what we would like to uh, speak to you about today. Sure, that sounds wonderful. I think to, you're cutting uh, out. I think you cut out on me there, Paul. I, I don't know if I have a bad connection or you do, but you, I just lost you for a few seconds there. Okay, let's. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So I was just saying, you know, that uh, this uh, everybody speaks. What what we wanted to talk to you about was uh, there are many many different theories as to who controls the power structure in this world from a human perspective. Now being that we are Christians and believers, we understand that this is more than just a mere human problem, uh, but uh, people talk about the Masonic order, they talk about the Bilderbergers or uh, you know the Trilateral Commission, uh, the Queen, etc. But what is generally well hidden is uh, the influence of the Vatican in general, but but of the Jesuit order, the so-called Society of Jesus in particular. Now, from what I have read and heard, I don't know of any person who is more qualified to speak to these matters than yourself. So could you please uh, give us a little introduction into what Romanism is and how it has directed world history now going back, I would say, a minimum of 2,000 years. Amen. Well, the, um, <clears throat> the, the, as I show in my book, I show that Rome really has never ceased to exist. The Roman Caesar became the Bishop of Rome and, um, and ultimately his power increased so that in 606, uh, 8606, he was given universal spiritual power, and 150 years later, he was given, uh, in 756, he was given universal temporal power by Pepin the Great. So Phocas, a, a murderer and a bloody dictator in Constantinople, gave the Bishop of Rome universal spiritual power, and Pepin, another bloody murderer, gave the Pope universal temporal power. And this is where we see the two keys are displayed on the papal flag, the gold key for spiritual power, the silver key for temporal power. And by the way, it's the same silver key, uh, clutching this being clutched by an eagle that is displayed with the National Security Agency. And on that website, it will tell you that silver key stands for the power of Peter binding and loosing. So it tells you NSA is completely upholding the temporal power of the Pope. Uh, 
So this continues um, through the Caesars, uh, through the uh, Caesars, to about the fifth century, and then really the first pope I consider to be Damasus the first. He um, he now is being used by the devil to consolidate all religious power into the hands of this one man. And there's other archbishops and bishops of different cities who consider the title Bishop of Bishops to be a title of Antichrist. And I covered that in my concon. And uh, so, but this title continues to grow and grow. And then finally, we have uh, in 1870, the D Vatican I, where the Pope is given the doctrine of infallibility when he speaks ex cathedra, which now is a complete and total usurpation of the Word of God. And this is why Germany said, we will not have that doctrine of infallibility enforced in Germany. And Bismarck and Kaiser Wilhelm I led the way. And because it said it overthrows the, the power and the rightful governing authority of our Kaiser. And so they, they just so happened uh, uh, to go, go head to head. And the Jesuits were expelled in 1872 out of Germany and remained expelled until 1917. But it's all about geopolitical power to make the Pope of Rome the universal monarch of the world, to rule all governments of the world, so that all the leaders of the world will submit to the political power of the Pope of Rome and bring their countries in line so that the Pope can rule them all to return the world to the Dark Ages, to obliterate the Protestant Reformation. There will be no more reformed countries. There will be no more middle class. There will be no more written constitutions limiting the powers of government. All of this will be destroyed in the restoration of the Pope's Dark Ages under an, an, another Innocent III or Hellbrand or, or Hildebrand. And uh, that's what they intend to do, spearheaded by the Jesuit order. So is this uh, plan that you're speaking about, is this something which lies uh, way ahead in the future? Or is it, uh, uh, its fruition is uh, almost complete in your opinion? Well, I think its fruition is complete as far as the Roman papacy controlling every government on earth. I mean, there, there is no government that is not directly or indirectly controlled by the Pope. And anybody who gets out of line, like Gaddafi or Kennedy or, or uh, Arafat, or not Arafat, but uh, Sadat, uh, any political leader that goes against the determinations of the Pope Rabin, uh, they kill, they eliminate, or they remove him through some disgraceful... Uh, situation like Nixon but all the nations of the world all the governments of the world are now subject to the Pope and the the nation that maintains the Pope's temporal power around the world is in the US Washington DC through the through the uh, NSA in the, in the Fort Meade Maryland and through the Central Intelligence Agency at Langley Virginia and that's the real power controlling the politics of this country and the Knights of Malta run both these agencies they run the Pentagon they run the Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta is a Knight of Malta and so Martin Dempsey the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is another Knight of Malta so they all have allegiance to the Pope of Rome the Chief Justice of the United States John Roberts after he decided for the Obama Unhealth Care Act, which was the deciding vote, first thing he does is leave the country, he goes to Malta, and they induct him into the Knights of Malta. So our chief Supreme Court justice is another Knight of Malta working for the benefit of Rome. So they run everything in this country, they run the military industrial complex, they run the whole economy because the economy is a war economy since March 9th, 1933, when FDR... Uh, put forth his proclamation 20, 20, 30, 2040, and it was validated by the Emergency Banking Relief Act. The only law in this country today is the Emergency Banking Relief Act that brought in the Trading with the Enemy Act inland, and FDR, his proclamation was validated by it. So we're living under a de facto military government here, and everything in this country is martial and commercial, and it's all for the purpose of restoring the Pope's temporal power around the world. Now, for those of us, those people who may not be uh, aware of these organizations that you are mentioning, such as the Knights of Malta, these are all orders that are affiliated with or that have come out of the, the, the Roman Catholic Church. Is that correct? That's correct. The Knights of Malta, they're, the, uh, <clears throat> they're, they're called the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem. 
the, the Hospitallers. That's the oldest military order, established in like 1048 or thereabouts. It was the leader of the First Crusade, which was uh, took from the Muslims in 1099. And so it is a military order. And this military order is, is, is primarily Roman Catholic, but there are other branches of it throughout the nations. For example, there is a, there's an order of the Knights of Malta in Russia, of which they call it as an Orthodox branch. And that's the branch that Len Horowitz is a member of. Then we have the American branch of the Knights of Malta, which uh, is centered in New York City, in Washington, D.C., or New York City. There's one in Washington, D.C., New York City, and one other branch, but it's primarily centered in Washington, or New York City, pardon me, in St. Patrick's Cathedral. And the knights there are most significant knights, like, um, like I said, uh, Leon Panetta. And Leon Panetta was a very influential individual at the Jesuit University of Santa Clara in California. So Leon Panetta, he also helped to design the uh, Denver airport, which is in the shape of a swastika. So these Knights of Malta are busy uh, secretly having their allegiance to the Pope of Rome. They're traitors to the government that they're a part of and should be tried for high treason and executed, every one of them. So all these knights are busy using the blood and treasure and people and natural resources of North America to build the New World Order, which is a Jesuit New World Order, under a Jesuit Pope, Francis I, of their making. Now, is this... Has this come to complete fruition? Well, as long as I believe the Spirit of God is in the world today and the true Church of Jesus Christ has the power of the Spirit of God, we can always set back this mystery of iniquity. And that's one of the things I preach on very hard, that we would begin to set it back, to expose it, that the Lord would get involved and start to expose these tyrants and sinners so that people can rise up and say we want them out. And if necessary, we can have a God holy revolution to get rid of these traitors that have usurped all of our governments and we can restore true nationalism where the people of a nation can be self-governing. Okay, so the, so the way that Rome, now, you know, I was listening to a show and uh, I'm not sure, like somebody, I think it was Wayne Madsen and he was, he, somebody was asking him about the Jesuit order and the power of Rome and he kind of brushed it off and he said, you know, Stalin had made a comment that how many divisions does the, Ro does the Pope control and basically uh, giving people the idea that since uh, the Pope or, or the Vatican does not have a, a big army or something, they really have no power. But the power, the way they exercise power is by putting these people in power, such as these uh, high knights of Malta and uh, other people from other secret orders that are working on the behalf of Rome. Is that how? Yeah, right, right. Absolutely. You see, I regard all these alternative guys, Wayne Madsons and nothing but another guy working for the Pope of Rome, misdirecting, just like Tex Mars, just like Michael Collins Piper. Uh, all these guys, they're busy redirecting your attention away from the Pope of Rome. I'll debate him any day of the week. Secondly, um, Stalin made the comment, how many, are, how many divisions the Pope command? Well, it's simple, Joey, all of them. And Joseph Stalin was trained by Capuchin priests in Gori and as a young man, and he did so well that they gave him, a, that these Roman Catholic Capuchin priests gave him a scholarship to Tiflis Seminary. And he went to Tiflis from 1895 to 1899, and there he was groomed in the doctrines of communism. And we're all told that he was kicked out of the seminary because of his communist influence. No, he wasn't. He was groomed there. And then they dismissed him, and then he was arrested, and then somehow he manages to escape. <laughs> and then he becomes the power in the Bolshevik Revolution that was financed by Wall Street and the Knights there on 120 Broadway. No, Joseph Stalin was a high-level Freemason. If you read the book, The Deadly Deception by, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, his name eludes me right now, but The Deadly Deception. He so shows you that at Yalta, the three men in charge there that were the centerpiece were FDR, Churchill, and Stalin. And the, the author says all of them were Masons. All of them. <laughs> Joseph Stalin was the Grand Inquisitor of Russia working for the Pope of Rome to destroy Orthodox Christian manhood so that the Vatican could then ultimately totally control the Russian government after the Cold War, which was past the 12th Cold War, and it was really bogus because not a blow was ever dealt to the Russian communists. Only blows were dealt to American uh, Protestant peoples during the Cold War, financially and, and bodily. 
And so Joseph Stalin was working for the Pope. He knew it. He was put in power by, by Edmund Walsh. Edmund Walsh went to Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution, and from 1922 to 1924, he spent two years there organizing the government there in Russia where he secretly put Stalin in power, and yet openly they put Lenin in there until they poisoned him. So Stalin worked for the Jesuits. His, he, Stalin secretly worked with Hitler during World War II. There's a tremendous book called Hitler's Traitor written by a Kilzer, and it shows that within 24 hours after every one of Hitler's orders, uh, Stalin knew about it while they're busy working together. So Joseph Stalin knew that the, the, that the Pope commanded all the armies of America, of Britain, of Russia, of Germany, of Italy. He commanded them all, and also the commanders. So that, that's where people don't uh, put the uh, pieces together, that it is not necessarily by having an army that says the Vatican Army, it is by controlling people in high positions of leadership, and not just in political leadership, but also in business and financial leadership. Uh, I, I believe that a lot of the, the banking structures and the corporation heads, they are also very much affiliated, affiliated with and uh, give allegiance to Rome, do they not? Absolutely. The largest bank in the world is Bank of America. Bank of America was founded by uh, Amato Giannini. Giannini was, he started the bank in San Francisco, the Jesuit haven of San Francisco. We know from uh, Charles Chenicky, who was a priest, he got saved. He says in his 50 years in the Church of Rome that San Francisco it was in the hands of the Jesuits as of 1850. And so in this Jesuit city of San Francisco, Giannini sets up the Bank of Italy in about 1904, somewhere around that time. And uh, then it changes the name to the Bank of America. Giannini was a knight of Malta. Uh, the Jesuits, according to Avril Manhattan, own at least 51% of all the stock in Bank of America. So the Jesuits with their Knights of Malta run Citibank, J.P. Morgan Chase, a Bank of America, you name them, they control them all, the big banks, uh, Schroeder Bank in Germany, uh, Credit Suisse in Switzerland, they control all the big Swiss banks, they control it, the Bank of International Settlements, the World Bank, all of it controlled by the Jesuits, and they're pagan Knights of Malta. So now let's talk about the Jesuits, like what is the Jesuit order? Well, the Jesuit order is a military company. They call themselves the company. Is just like the, the CIA, CIA is, is called the company? Just like the CIA is called the company. That's why the CIA is called the company. In fact, the, fir the, the forerunner of the CIA was the OSS. The OSS was headed by Knight of Malta, Wild Bill Donovan. And, right. Uh, so Wild Bill Donovan worked with Hitler and enabled the Nazi escape uh, after World War II. So, so the CIA is, I call it the Catholic Intelligence Agency, right. run by the Knights of Malta from the very beginning, and there have been, to my counting, six Knights of Malta that have headed the CIA. So the Jesuit order controls the CIA, and it's the company. The Jesuit order is called the company. In fact, they have a magazine. You can, your, any of your listeners can subscribe to it. It's called Company. It's a monthly uh, publication, and uh, it is a military order. They were first called by Ignatius Loyola, who was a military man in Spain, who had founded the order. He called it the Knights of the Virgin Mary. But later he changed it to the Society of Jesus, and then Calvin called it, surnamed it the Jesuits. So the Jesuit order um, is a military organization, and it was founded according to James A. Wiley in his tremendous three-volume work, the history of Protestantism, he tells you in the 50 pages in volume two um, about the purpose of the Jesuit order and what they've done. And their purpose was, number one, to take Jerusalem from the Saracens, to take Jerusalem from the Muslims. And the second purpose was uh, to then destroy the Protestant Reformation that was sweeping Europe, especially Northern Europe, and bringing liberty and middle class and the Bible into the hands of the common man. So those are their two major purposes, and it is a strictly military order. Napoleon speaks of this very thing. I quote him in my book, Vatican Assassins. He says it's a military order. The head of the Jesuits is a general, and what he wants is total power and absolute power, power to the control of the world by the volition of a single man. So it's a military organization. They are, it's an army set out to subjugate all nations to the rule of a pope of Jesuit control. So would you say then that out of all these uh, 
orders, uh, this is the one. Now, for one thing, all these orders, they, are, they have a militaristic and uh, a business nature. They really have nothing to do with the spirituality or being uh, humble, uh, you know, like they, they sometimes portray themselves to be, even like the Benedictines or the Franciscans and stuff, they were very much involved in business and commerce, uh, if not uh, so much militarily like the Jesuit order. So all these orders, that's the, all these secret orders, they have a completely different reality than the one that is portrayed to the world, that they are servants of the poor and all that, right? That's correct. We have to remember this one great maxim, and for all your listeners to remember, the Vatican and its orders always have, they always put forth an open but false policy. The open policy they advocate is a lie. Then they have a secret but true policy, and that secret policy can be found in their documents and their confessions of faith and their canon law, whatever. And I'll give you an example. At the time of the Iraqi war, uh, when that broke out, John Paul II said, this, is, this war is not right. I'm against the Iraqi war. Well, that was his open but false policy. The secret but true policy is his Knight of Malta, uh, George J. Tenet, who was the head of the CIA and on the, on the Security Council of this country, oversaw the entire agitation. He oversaw the entire 9-11 fiasco, which not one Muslim was involved. There were no Muslims in those airplanes. And Edward Cardinal Egan at the time was the head of the American branch of the Knights of Malta. So for, uh, for uh, Edward Cardinal Egan and George J. Tennant were the ones that, that facilitated the whole 9-11 thing and the ultimate invasion of Iraq. And then L. Paul Bremer, he was the inquisitor there in Iraq, and he was the one that created the insurgency by doing away with the Iraqi guard. Paul L. L. Paul Bremer is a CFR member, and he is also a Knight of Malta. So their open but false policy is to be against the Iraqi war. Their secret but true policy is to start it, back it, fund it, and finance it. So you always have to ask, well, this is the open policy here. What's the secret policy? And with that, you'll have a discernment on everything the Vatican and its knights will do. So these, uh, these wars, they never cease. Like if we look at the history of Europe, for example, you know, there was always some wars that were going on. And uh, the Vatican and the Pope were always in the midst of it, in the, I guess in the Middle Ages and before. They used to be openly involved in it, but since the at least the 20th century, they have sort of gone underground. And uh, in your book, I had, uh, and in other sources as well, that both the great wars, uh, they were essentially papal crusades, were they not? Absolutely. You mean World War One and World War II? World War One and World War Two. yes. Yes, yes. Uh, World War, I show in my book that World War One and World War Two is what I call the Second Thirty Years' War. And I was clued into this by a book called The Popes, the Kings, and the People, written in 1903. And the author said, the Vatican in a future day is going to orchestrate all these different countries to work together for one great and grand aim. And then the other author that, that clued me onto this was uh, Theodor Greisinger in his great work uh, on the Jesuits that he wrote for the benefit of the German people, and he published it in 1873. And he said, that what are we to expect with this doctrine of infallibility of the Pope in 1870? What are we to expect but another 30 years war? And it clicked. I said from 1914, from the guns of August 1914 to 1945, when the war ends in April, that uh, this is one huge second 30 years war. World War I never ended. It was an armistice. It was just a, a t time of relaxation so they could gear up for Adolf Hitler to, to recommence it. And the, the Jesuits oversaw the entire Treaty of Versailles. They oversaw uh, Marshal Falk of France, who was a Knight of Columbus. He was the leader of the Allied armies in World War I. They oversaw General Haig, who was that traitorous British general who sacrificed hundreds of thousands of his own British soldiers at Passchendaele and other places when he ordered them into the machine guns of the Germans to annihilate them. 
his own men. Um, it was a huge, and it was a destruction of the Protestant Second Reich, because the Second German Reich from 1871, after the Franco-Prussian War, from 1871 to, to 1918, the Second Reich was Protestant, and it was centered in, centered in Prussia, and it was established by that Prussian Lutheran who knew the Lord, uh, Otto von Bismarck. And uh, so it was the destruction of the Second Reich, but it was also the beginning of the destruction of the British Empire, because during World War One, World War One, the British lost 500 commercial ships to German U-boats. And oh, really? uh, yes, absolutely. And so, this, so when you when you kill, when you destroy the commercial shipping, you can't tie the British Empire together. So this was the end of the Protestant British Empire, and I sell on my website a book called Rome and the War, written by an anonymous author, and uh, he shows, it's about World War I, and he shows a lot of this in his book, and you can get it on my website at 247worldradio.com. But this was the first half. World War I was the opening salvo to kill the, the men, primarily the soldiers, the nationalist men of France, Germany, England, Russia, and America. And uh, the, the Battle of Tannenberg there in, in Russia was a deliberate sacrifice of Russian men to, to the German army because the Tsar Nicholas II uh, was working with George V. Both of them were cousins. They were both members of the Knights of Malta. Nicholas was the second was a knight, and George V, the King of England, King of Great Britain, was a knight. So they're coordinating their generals to work together for the deliberate murder of the manhood of those nations so that they can reduce those nations further to the temporal power of the Pope when there are no men to stand up against these tyrannies. Mm. That, well, you know, this is, uh, for me, of course, like having uh, studied these things now for quite some time, uh, not having as much knowledge and understanding of it as you do, but still enough to understand that, yes, that is how these things, they really do play out, that these wars, uh, they are orchestrated and they are managed and controlled. They are almost like uh, a Hollywood movie where they are scripted in a certain manner and that is something which, you know, the average person would find very, very difficult to believe. But uh, having read many, many books and read a lot of history, especially the Second World War, uh, I would have to concur with you that uh, the motivations of the leaders at the top are very much different than those of the poor soldiers that are being used as cannon fodder. And I think uh, Henry Absolutely. Kissinger, didn't Kissinger say something that they're just dumb cannon fodder or something yes. like that? Or, yes, that's what that center said. And in Cyprus, you know what they call him? They call him Henry Killinger. Because <laughs> he was behind the Turkish invasion in 1974. Well. So you're absolutely right. And let's take a couple examples for your listeners about World War II. Let's just talk about let's talk about Dunkirk. You have an expeditionary force of the British there that's in France. They've landed there, and this is the this is the this is the army of England. This is the army of Great Britain, and they are now advanced upon by German panzers, and the Germans are ready to annihilate the expeditionary force, and they could have. But what happens? Hitler gives an order. Let them escape. Do not capture them. And so they are rescued by British shipping and evacuated off the shores of France, off Dunkirk, to be brought back to England so that the war doesn't end. Hitler was working for the Pope, advised by Martin Bormann, who was a a, a Jesuit coadjutor, remember Martin Bormann's son, Adolf Martin Bormann, became a Jesuit priest. According to Nino Labello in his great work, The Vatican Papers, Martin Bormann escaped Europe in a Jesuit Cossack. So Martin Bormann told Hitler, um, you're, you're going to let them escape. And so that's exactly what Hitler did. And so that ensured a successful invasion because you see they needed more time they needed to end the war they needed more time to round up the Jews and kill them in the east now let's take another example let's take the Battle of Britain here we have the the Nazis are in France they've taken all of France and it's, it's taken Britain's gonna be a cakewalk there's no reason why the great German fighters and their bombers cannot bomb London uh, take down the fighters and invade 
uh, England. What happens is Hitler decides to stop the invasion of the Battle of Britain. And you know what he does? He, go, he turns around and he prepares for the invasion of Russia. Why would you take 3 million men and 3,000 tanks, the largest tank invasion in world history, and prepare to invade Russia when you can have easily taken Britain and Ireland, and now you can have a wall of defense against any Allied shipping that wants to come into Europe? We can sink every American freighter coming over. Because right. Hitler was working for the Pope. They yeah. wanted to extend the war. Now here's another, and by the way, I have a book called Hitler's Generals Talk. German generals talk, and they can't figure out why Hitler stopped the invasion of Britain. They can't get; they don't get it. Right. Well, this is why. Now, the next one is let's, let's talk about D-Day. Let's talk about Normandy. We have this huge, massive invasion in Normandy, or in France at the time. It's British, American, and uh, and they uh, they land on the shores there. And by the way, not a bomb, not one bomb landed on the pillbox and on the German troops at Normandy. All the American bombers, they bombed the ocean and they bombed behind the lines, but they never bombed anything. Any of the soldiers there with the machine guns were going to be busy gunning down the American soldiers, most of whom at that initial landing were white Protestants from Maryland and Pennsylvania and Virginia. Really? We've got to kill these Protestants. That's right. That's exactly right. And uh, then what we're going to do is, um, now that we have them landed on the beach, we're, we're finally going to get a foothold. And we're going to march into France, call it, into a place called Falaise. And this is the most notable incident of the Falaise pocket. The Americans with the British surround 250,000 German troops. They're surrounded. And all they have to be done is just given the ultimatum, surrender now or we're going to bomb you and we're going to kill all of you. What happens? Patton, Patton writes his wife, and he says, in 10 days, the war is going to be over. Oh, no. Patton gets an order from Eisenhower, that pimp, working for Marshall, George C. Marshall, that 33rd degree Freemason. And, uh, and he gets an order, and, tell, and he's told, you will not close the fillet's pocket. This facilitates 200,000 Germans to escape. Only 50,000 were captured, and this enables the Battle of the Bulge to take place later, which is horrible in its losses. So they deliberately refused to win the war in 1944 because, you see, the Jesuits had another, oh, at least another million Jews to kill in Auschwitz and the, and the death camps in Poland. They got 800,000 Jews got to be shipped out of Hungary to Auschwitz and the camps in Poland, and that would never have happened had they closed the fillet's pocket. So this, it's, it's, it's one thing like this, one after another after another, that I cover in my book in Chapter 37. I cover 150 pages of these kinds of records. Uh, the Battle of Harkin Forest, it's another one. There were, what, 60,000 casualties there of American and German casualties, and there's no reason to have the Battle of Harkin Forest. So it just goes on and on. It's a deliberate sacrifice of American troops and British troops and German troops because, you see, we've got to kill all these German Protestants too. Germany was the center of the Protestant Reformation, and we have to utterly crush out and kill out any vestige of the Reformation in Germany. And that's why FDR, advised by Harry Hopkins and that other evil, wicked center, uh, oh, what was his name? Oh, he was another Bowensman, um, signed the Lend-Lease Act in 1941. Um, they advised him to give all of East Germany to Joe Stalin. And when the Russian soldiers came into East Germany, uh, they raped every woman they could find. They raped eight, gang raped eight million women. They were so gang raped that many of them threw themselves in the wells to commit suicide rather than continue to be raped. In this way, they were bastardizing the German race in the East, the historic Protestant Prussian people. In 1946, that's the end of Protestant Prussia. There is no more Reformation in Europe or in Germany. So they accomplished a whole bunch of things. We're going to kill all these nationalists, be they Catholic or Protestant. We're going to destroy the Reformation. We're going to, we're going to pave the way for the Cold War by destroying all the nationalists. And then after the Cold War, we're going to reunite Germany. Uh, and, and Germany is going to be our center economic hub for a European Union that will be Roman Catholic subject to the Pope of Rome. Yes. Uh, now, 
I would agree with what you're saying here because none of this history really as far as a military campaign is concerned makes sense if these guys were all like real enemies you know going at it as they might have in the days right. of old. Uh, so in, as far as even uh, the Russian campaign is concerned, now what it sounds like to me was that the German army was truly probably the finest army the world has ever seen. And they could have easily taken Europe and they could have easily taken Russia as well if they had sure. done it. If they had were really fighting a real war, like you said, they should have gone in and taken Britain and then they could have turned their direction. Because Russia was not really uh, a major fighting force was it. They had a lot of people, but they were now nowhere near as well trained or well equipped as the Germans were. No. At least that's what I understand. Absolutely. And the other thing too you want to remember is that is that um, Russia had no domestic manufacturers. They had barely began to mechanize their army with the Gorky manufacturing plant set up by Dirty Henry Ford. And so um, the other thing is is that the Lend Lease by Averil Averil Harriman he's the one he's the bondsman. Averil Harriman signed the Lend Lease Act in June I believe of 1941, six months before the U.S. went to war with Japan. And gave 11.3 billion, that's with a B, billion American gold dollars to Joseph Stalin to mechanize his uh, war machine. So without America building Joe Stalin, which at the time, which at the time, we were we were enemies with Russia because Stalin was on the side of the of Hitler until Hitler invaded in what of June 1941 with Barbarossa, and all of a sudden then FDR and Abraham Harriman and all the Jesuits in this country said, "Oh, we're going to help Joseph Stalin now," but still Russia was not a a truly mechanized uh, discipline had a war machine of such and so Germany the, the, the Nazis the German army could have easily went into Moscow and taken Moscow in fact I know an old Nazi an old SS man his name was Freddy he came over here and he said to me we were 18 kilometers from Moscow we, we had chickens tied to our belts we had food to eat and we get this order from Hitler that we cannot take Moscow we must go south and it's approaching the dead of winter so mm. Hitler, again, refused to win by taking Russia, and, that, and then also that uh, paved the way for the destruction of the Sixth Army when von Paulus was not allowed to conduct a military maneuver that was saved, would have saved his army. His army was encircled. It, uh, the Soviets took 91,000 prisoners, and of all those prisoners, only 5,000 ever returned back to Germany. So it was an annihilation of German manhood, facilitated by Hitler and Stalin, working together, financed by, by the U.S. and London, by Washington, New York, and London. And that's how the whole war went. And it's, there were certain setbacks, like certain generals had to be killed. Uh, Heydrich, for example, had to be killed. Uh, the Butcher of Prague, because Reinhard Heydrich wanted to win. And right. so because, because Heydrich wanted to win, he was uh, assassinated in Prague where Sir Stuart Menzies, his British intelligence, with Himmler's SS, worked together for the murder of Reinhard Heydrich. And then we have another guy that was killed, um, Gene Darlin. He was an admiral in the French army. He wanted to win, so they killed him. We have uh, Patton. They killed him because he wanted to march to Moscow and end it right now. So they, they, they got him in a car wreck, and Bezata, who was involved in the assassination, confessed to 350 people in Washington, D.C., that Patton was murdered. He knows the guy who killed him. It was a $10,000 contract. And then there was another book that was released called Target Patton, where, where it proves some of the same things, and that his vehicle that was on display in the museum was a fake. So that they really didn't want to get the real one there because it showed remnants of a bullet and it was Patton was shot with a rubber bullet to get him to the hospital so they could poison him there. They, so they got rid of Patton, they got rid of Darlin, they got rid of Heydrich, they got rid of Yamamoto, uh, Japanese General Yamamoto who wanted to surrender. Well, they're going to shoot him down, make sure he can't surrender because we have to detonate some atomic bombs on the ground in Japan so we can create the bogus airborne nuclear war hoax that's going to be the foundation for the bogus Cold War hoax. So they had all these different designs orchestrating and working together, being very carefully uh, proceeded w with by the Jesuits designing them and then their military commanders carrying them out. 
Now, these Russians, uh, they were obviously not very big fans of Stalin and they wanted to get rid of them. Is it, this is this a little known part of history that uh, there was a whole Russian army that actually fought with the Germans. Is that, uh, can you tell us about that? that that's, that's absolutely right. It's called Vlasov's army. Andrei Vlasov was the greatest Russian general. Every Russian should have a picture of Andrei Vlasov in his house. Andrei Vlasov was, was uh, an orthodox man. He prepared for the priesthood. He was a truly a nationalist. He loved his country. Uh, but he, when he lost a battle, he was, went into Germany, and there he offered Hitler to raise uh, a Russian army uh, that would be against the Red Army. And so that's what he did. But because Hitler was working with Stalin, Hitler refused to put a 700,000 man Russian army against the Red Army. He refused to do it until it was too late. Then he fielded Vlazov's army, which then was routed, and Vlazov was taken back to Moscow. He was he was tortured in Lubyanka by the Jesuits and by by that wicked Jesuit who was the advisor of Joseph Stalin. His name was Alexander Paskrevichev. Alexander Paskrevichev, the general, lived with Stalin in the Kremlin, and he personally oversaw the torture and murder of Nikolai uh, Andrei Vlazov. And this also goes to another thing I wanted to mention before I forget was that. Uh, the, the Ukraine hated Stalin. The Ukraine um, wanted nothing they to do with the him. Germans, right? They, 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 they were welcomed the Germans. They welcomed the Germans with bread and salt and, and, and helped them on in their invasion and said, thank God someone's going to deliver us from Joe Stalin because what did Stalin do to the Ukrainians? Joseph Stalin shut, sh shut down the grain in the Ukraine and starved from, anywhere from 7 to 10 million Ukrainian people. You know why? Because they're Orthodox. Orthodox are condemned by the Council of Trent, Orthodox Christians. Mm. And so that's what he did to them. And then when the Ukrainians welcomed the German army in there, trusting that, that, that the policy of Hitler was going to be true, that he was going to remove Stalin, why then they were all betrayed by Hitler when Hitler ordered his armies south and not to take Moscow. And then ultimately the Ukrainians, many of them are killed. They're driven into the Soviet army. And they are on, on Zhukov's uh, march uh, west in, in, in taking uh, Poland and Germany. Uh, you have the NKVD with machine guns behind the, the Ukrainian army uh, there. The Ukrainians fighting for the Russians, for the Soviets. And if any of them turn back and don't want to fight, the NKVD machine guns them. Zhukov deliberately lost in excess of 600,000 Russian soldiers in his, in, his, in his race to Berlin. Because what were they doing? They were killing Orthodox manhood of Russia. Zhukov was a traitor, just like Stalin. So all these things are working together for these great ends as set forth by the Jesuit Order and their Council of Trent as they controlled all the intelligence communities of the war, every one of them. Are not all the intelligence communities patterned after the Jesuit order? <laughs> That's right. They all have a, a central figure who's the head. And then that head has certain subordinates of different departments. And then those subordinates run their departments. It's just like the Jesuit general. He's called the Jesuit superior general. And then he has generals underneath him. And those generals underneath him are called the assistants. Presently, there are 10 assistants to Black Pope Adolfo Nicholas. And after this war in the Middle East and the subjugation of Islam, particularly Shia, there's going to be 11 assistants. But right now, there's only 10. Because there's 10 assistancies in the world. There's one, they have the American assistancy headed by a guy named James Grummer, a traitor. So you have the, uh, the assistants to the Jesuit general. They are military men. And, uh, and this is how Himmler patterns his SS. Himmler regarded himself, this is according to Walter Schellenberg in his book, Labyrinth. Uh, Schellenberg was, was the leading general in the SSSD. And uh, that's, that's the foreign SS. And so he tells in his book, Labyrinth, that Himmler designed the whole SS after the Jesuit order, that Heinrich Himmler regarded himself as a Jesuit general, and all of his lower uh, uh, generals there in the SS that used to meet at Wielsburg, Castle, uh, they regarded themselves as, as subordinates to the to the Black Pope, to the Jesuit General uh, 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 Heinrich Himmler. So they then brought all this this uh, this this uh, manner of of structure into the CIA.
because the CIA is the merging of the OSS with the SS here in the West, and the KGB is the merging of the NKVD with the SS in Russia, because SS men went into Russia, SS men went into America to be able to, to coordinate and facilitate the working of both intelligence communities together for the entire duration of the Cold War. Now, is it is true, is it not, that the CIA is actually a creation of the Vatican? Of course. Central Intelligence Agency was created in 1947 with the National Security Act, signed into law by Dirty Harry Truman. Uh, Harry Truman, with that National Security Act, created the created the NSA, and he created the um, created the uh, CIA, and he also created the Department of Defense. The, de the War Department then became known as the Defense Department, because you see, we have to deceive everybody, making them think that this military that we're making is going to be for the defense of America. It's not for the defense of America, it's for the war on all nations that the Pope wants to make war on. So that's right, it was absolutely uh, passed by, by, Dirty, by Harry Truman in 1947, and then after the assassination of Kennedy, Harry Truman came and the, and, the, and, the, and the failure of the Bay of Pigs, I believe, and then the assassination of Kennedy, yeah, according to Fletcher Prouty in his work, JFK. He, Truman says that the CIA has become a symbol of sinister foreign intrigue. And Harry Truman knew exactly who the foreigner was. It was Pope. It was the poet, Pope John, Pope Paul VI at the time, at the time of the Kennedy assassination. He knew, but he'll, he would never talk because he was a wicked, diabolical servant of the Pope. He ran a whorehouse in, in, uh, in Missouri. He was known as Whorehouse Harry, and he was called Dirty Harry by the Japanese. I have a Japanese mission, uh, Bible-believing friend who's, who's since called to be with the Lord, uh, Brother Daniel Fuji. And he said, all of us in Japan, he said, you know what we called him? We called him Dirty Harry. And when that movie came out, Dirty Harry, we in Japan thought, oh, they were all making a movie on Dirty Harry Truman. <laughs> because, because they knew there was no need to have any atomic detonation. As the Japanese had offered to surrender six months before the detonation, for the on-ground detonation at Hiroshima on the 6th of August, and the on-ground detonation at Nagasaki on the 9th. He knows that. Okay, we'll talk we about that. that in a second. I think there's a caller here. Let's see. Uh, hello? Hello, caller? Hello? I guess he's gone. Okay, no worries. Uh, so go on. Uh, you were talking about this. Uh, this. Uh, what I wanted to point out was that in regards to the CIA in particular, what I have read is that from its very beginning, it was actually manned or staffed by a lot of Nazis that had been uh, smuggled out of Germany. Is that correct? Absolutely. One of them that was in the CIA was the head of the Gestapo, Heinrich Mueller. Heinrich Mueller, that bloodthirsty killer, was brought into the CIA. He dies, he lives in Virginia, and he dies sometime in 1973 or thereabouts. Heinrich Mueller should have been hung, but oh no, he's going to be protected by CIA. And they did this with many other Nazis. Um, they brought in thousands of Nazis into the U.S. They put them in NASA, they put them in the CIA, they put them in the FBI, they put them in military intelligence. That's because they were saving their inquisitors that had successfully carried out nearly the purge of all the Jews in Europe. Yep. Okay. So, so these people that came into the CIA or the or who started in NASA, etc., like they most of them escaped on uh, it through what's called the Vatican rat line. So they were assisted by the Vatican in escaping uh, out of Europe and into the U.S., Canada, and down into South America. So if, if it was the Vatican that was helping bring all these people in, then would it not stand to reason that uh, it is the Vatican who would still be controlling them? To this Absolutely. Day? And, and a very good book that covers a lot of this, even though I don't agree with everything he says. I mean, he holds up the veracity of the Cold War like it's a real thing. But uh, the Irish Roman Catholic, uh, John Loftus, in his book, Unholy Trinity, he shows that the Vatican facilitated all the rat lines. Cardinal Spellman was the big rat <laughs> in America that brought all these Germans, all these Nazis, I shouldn't say Germans, I should say Nazis, into America after the war. Francis Cardinal Spellman oversaw it all. 
So yes, uh, and I was in Austria just last year, and my Austrian um, guide showed me the Brenner Pass. And there at the Brenner Pass is when the Jesuits were there at the Brenner Pass escorting um, Rausch and other top Nazi officers out of Austria into, into Italy ultimately to then be ferried across the, the oceans to the various destinations they were supposed to go to. So the Jesuits controlled the Brenner Pass. They were the ones responsible for getting all these Nazis out. And the other way they, the Jesuits got the Nazis out, you're going to love this, was the Berlin Airlift. <laughs> oh, really? The okay. Berlin Airlift. Yeah. Um, so, so Stalin, what does he do? Big Bad Joseph Stalin's going to close off Berlin. Stalin's nothing. Our American troops could go in there and do a tap dance on those Russians anytime we wanted to. They had no manufacturing base. Russia's in shambles. They don't have a base for anything. And they're going to c c shut off Berlin to America? Are you kidding me? <laughs> but oh no, because the Jesuits run Truman and the Jesuits run Stalin. They're going to create this bogus threat of Berlin and, and the, the Russians have shut off Berlin and so now we need the American uh, military and Air Force to fly in all these supplies to the Germans there in Berlin, which they needed our food, no doubt. But what were those planes coming out with? Were they deadheading out of there? Oh no. They were loading up with Nazis in Berlin and flying them out of there. That's what happened. And they did this for one whole year. The Berlin airlift lasted a year. So more treason, more saving of, those, of the SS killers who were primarily Bavarian Roman Catholics and Austrian Roman Catholics. There were Protestants in it, but primarily Bavarian and Austrian Roman Catholics. So we're going to save them. We're going to bring them out of the country. And we're going to take them to Ireland and England and Canada and North America because we have to reward them for carrying out the unholy Council of Trent and carrying out canon law where, according to Aquinas, it's no murder to kill a heretic. Okay, we'll talk about uh, the, the Council of Trent in one second, but uh, so would it then be correct to say that the Nazis won the war, although Germany lost the war? That's right. The Nazis won the war, the SS won the war, but the poor German people lost the war. That's right. And today, the German people are constantly harassed with the stigma that they're Germans, that they killed the Jews. And I'll tell you this, the, Ger the German, the many, many German people were driven into the, to the Nazi party, into the military. Do you realize it was a death sentence to refuse to go in the Weimar? Well, what? If they called you, you better go. So they drafted all their sons and sent most of them off to the Eastern Front to be killed, to be sabotaged, to be deliberately sacrificed on the Eastern Front. And so now we're going to blame the German people for the Eurasian Jewish Holocaust when it would never have happened had not, uh, had not Washington, D.C., New York, and London financed the rise of Hitler to power and financed the building of the German army and financed the building of the Russian army because Hitler and Stalin worked together for the destruction of the Jews. If the Jews run Russia, if those Jews run communist Russia, tell me why Stalin and Beria did not allow hundreds of thousands of Jews in Germany and Eastern Europe to flee into Russia. There's a book you want to get, your listeners want to get, it's called Bloodlands. And it's all about the destruction of Jewry and what was known as the Pale of Settlement. So Stalin and Hitler worked together. But, oh, no, we can't blame the Russians for this. We can't blame, we've got to blame only the Germans. And we can't blame the Americans for this because, after all, uh, dirty FDR with his Jesuit co-adjutors, uh, Sumner Wells, and the other one um, that was Secretary of State at the time, um, uh, they're not going to allow any Jews to flee Europe to come to America. And we're going to turn the St. Louis back that's in Havana, in Cuba. And we're going to send the St. Louis, which is full of Jews, it's full of European Jews. We're going to send them back to Europe so they can die at Dock in Hamburg. They're going to be arrested, and they're going to be sent to Auschwitz and other concentration camps. All because of FDR. So, so, what, so what, what, what do you say to people that then, then, then say that uh, Stalin and Hitler were Jews? That's nonsense. It's ridiculous. Prove it, I say. I prove it in my work, Stalin was no Jew. I show Barry was no Jew. That's all Tex Mars, Jesuit Austrian trash. They were Gentiles. Uh, Stalin hated the Jews. His daughter Svetlana married a Jew. 
His first husband was a Jew. Stalin hated him. Stalin was the one behind the, the doctor's plot to, to drum up all anti-Jewish fury in Russia to round up all the Jews and to send them to camps. But thank God he died before he could carry it out. Stalin hated the Jews. Stalin and Hitler worked together. Look at the book, Hitler's Traitor. Hitler, Hitler was partially Jewish because his mother evidently had sex with a grocer, an Austrian grocer, whose name was Sachs, S-A-C-H-S. And you can find this in a book called I Was Hitler's Doctor by uh, Kurt Kruger. They wrote it in 1934. And Hitler thought he could, his mother could have very well been impregnated by this Jewish grocer, which further incited his hatred for the Jews. Partially Jewish, yes, but he was no Jew. Well, you know, that, see, that never did make sense to me because uh, if you read history right up until the, the Second World War, with what, what happened with the Jews in Germany and all through the, you know, the, the pogroms in Russia and everywhere else, and all of a sudden, and again, like you're making the mention of this ship that was turned back full of Jews uh, from America, then how come all of a sudden after the war we have suddenly that it is the Jews that are controlling Washington? That never did make any sense to me. So all these people that promote this, uh, the Zionists are uh, the ones that are running things. Uh, it's a smokescreen, uh, of course, for the Vatican and the Jesuit order. Yes, we have to cover this, though, somewhat, because on its face, it looks true. Okay? Mm -hmm. If you go to a CFR annual report, and I have most of them here. i got to get the last two. But it's an annual report. You're going to see a list of at least 500 to 800 Jewish names in the CFR. Well, the Council on Foreign Relations was established here in 1921. Uh, the Royal Institute for International Affairs in London was established in 1919, uh, both of this right after World War I. But the Council on Foreign Relations is the Archbishop of New York City's trusted third party to run this empire. And so what do they do? They get as many court Jews as they can up front and public so that in the future when they want to implement fascism and kill all the Jews in North America, which is what they're going to do here, God doesn't stop it, uh, they can blame the Jews. Why, look at that, Henry Kissinger, he ran Nixon. No, he didn't. Alexander Haig ran him. That's that not a Malta. And Alexander Haig's brother is Francis Haig. He's still a professor of physics over in uh, uh, Loyola in, uh, in uh, Baltimore. The Haig brothers ran Nixon, not Kissinger. Kissinger is nothing but a court Jew, and he was friends with Nazis in Germany before he came over to this country. Well, we're going to say George Soros. Look at that Jew. He's behind Barry Davis. He's behind Barack Obama. George Soros is peanuts, man. He's just a Hungarian Jew who was not killed by the labor Zionists and brought over here. And uh, George Soros makes it openly look like the Jews are the ones backing Obama bringing all this socialist, communist destruction of historic white Protestant culture because Obama hates white people. He's a mulatto and he hates white people, just like his wife hates white people. So we're going to implement all this anti-white legislation for the destruction of the historic white Protestant middle class. And who are we going to blame for it? Why, we're going to blame the Jews. We're going to blame George Soros. And that's exactly where the Jesuits want the white people of North America, and specifically America, to go. And so that's one of the things I preach against, and I try to expose as much as I can. But there are openly open Jews that are, seem to run things, like in Hollywood, but secretly the Jesuits run it all. I work with a guy that was the manager of the black comedian, uh, Gary Coleman. Mm -hmm. His name is Victor Perillo. Victor Perillo has put together a screenplay called The Lambert Chronicles. And in this, these Lambert Chronicles, it's based upon the true life of, uh, of Major Warren Lambert, who was one of the uh, judges and one of the eight American judges at Dachau. And Warren Lambert recorded all the influences of the priests and the Jesuits at Dachau during that trial. And he managed to smuggle all of his notes out of Germany, and his grandson found those notes in his grandmother's attic. Well, he gave all those notes of the Lambert, of the Lambert uh, experience there in Germany, post-war Germany, to, uh, to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And so Victor Perillo got a copy of these notes from the grandson, and he wrote a play on it. 
called the Lambert Chronicles. And by the way, we're looking for financing. Anybody you know with any money? We cannot make this movie in, in North America because the Jesuits run Hollywood and all the studios. And that's exactly what Victor Perilla said. He said, Eric, we cannot make this movie in North America, but we're going to make it in Germany. And I said, good, that's where it needs to be made. So we need financing for that, and then my point is that Victor Perillo said, and because he worked in Hollywood for years as the, as the uh, uh, manager for Gary Coleman, he said the Jesuits run Hollywood, lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, totally believable, totally. Can you hold on one second, Eric? Let me see there's somebody sure. else that's uh, sure. uh, on the line. Uh, hello, caller. Can you, uh, hello? Hey, Paul. It's Tim Cook calling from Southwest Florida. Hello there, Tim. How are you doing, my friend? I'm doing very well, thanks. Um, before you guys uh, complete uh, the discussion, would you have Eric uh, let the, all of us listeners know what he thinks of what we're going to be in store for for the next decade globally? As far as are we getting close to World War III, or do we do we have some time left on the calendar? Okay, Tim, that sounds good. Eric, did you hear uh, Tim's question? Yes, I did, Tim. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, I always try to not date set, um, but I always try to event set. When it happens, you know, it's within the providence of God, the Spirit of God restraining the mystery of iniquity or allowing it to proceed, depending upon the iniquity of the people of the nations that are targeted. So I tend to think that the, the next event we're going to have is we're going to have a two-front war, well, the first thing we're going to have is we're going to have martial law in America. We're going to have a suspension of the Constitution, and the, and the Pope's Department of Rome Land Security is going to restore order, quote-unquote, after the Jesuits incite a black-on-white race war in every major city by way of black Freemasonry, which includes the Nation of Islam. Once we have the black-on-white race war raging, and it's, it's raging to a certain degree already, but it's going to be really raging, and then all the white people are going to say, oh, God, help us, and then that's when the Department of Homeland Security is going to come out and save the day. The problem is the Department of Homeland Security was created by Jesuit John C. Gannon, and John C. Gannon was uh, in the CIA for some 23 years, gave the daily brief, and so the Department of Homeland Security is not only going to round up all these rioters and murderers and killers going on in the major cities, but they're going to start rounding up other people too. So we're going to have a repeat of Nazi Germany here in America. That includes the persecution of the Jews. I've warned that every Jew in North America is targeted for annihilation unless the Lord reverses what's happening now. And so with that, we're going to have the violation of the covenant of Genesis 12, 1 through 3. I'll bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee. And so we're going to have the curse of God now on our, the people of this country that have allowed this government to do what it's doing. The next thing that's going to happen is we're going to have a two-front war. And it will be, I'm convinced, most assuredly, it will involve Iran because the Shia Muslims are the targeted population for destruction among Muslim peoples. Remember, the Shia are not allowed to go to Mecca. The Shia are not allowed to go to Medina. Uh, the Sunnis hate their guts, along with the Wahhabis and the Sufis. So the Shia are targeted for destruction. There are 20,000 Jews right now that live in Tehran, and the Shia generally do not persecute Jews. So the Shia have to go, and therefore there most assuredly will be a war in Iran. But in that war of Iran, Russia is going to side with Iran, China is going to side with Iran, and then we're going to have the building and the ultimate perfection of the Sino-Soviet Muslim coalition that I talk about in my book that will ultimately be used to invade North America. It won't happen quite yet because China now has taken on a contract to build a huge, a huge canal through Guatemala, and uh, that will be for all the Chinese Navy to come through into the Caribbean, to, to the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico when the invasion takes place. Remember, the Chinese, Chinese has the Chinese Overseas Shipping Company, which has an excess of 6,000 freighters, and they're all in the Chinese Navy, Red Chinese Navy. So we have this encirclement policy continuing to take place around North America, facilitated by the Jesuits using the White House, the Pentagon, We're secretly working with the Chinese intelligence service, with the, so with the Russian SVR, and with uh, the Muslim nations. While at the same time, we're going to have a two-front war, one in the Far East, one in the Near East, where our armies are going to be sacrificed. 
I have a, a, tremendous, a high level intelligence officer who told me that they're planning to sacrifice the entire American military that will be in Iraq, Iran, and that general region. There will be no escape. So once they kill off all our best guys, all our SEALs, all our Delta teams, all that, that'll, that'll further enable a successful invasion of this place. So I see all these things happening and each little, there's a piece put in place like every week or so that furthers this end. But nothing is done to stop this crusade. Nothing is done to blame the Vatican and its papal knights for 9-11. Nothing is done to blame Joe Biden and George J. Tennant for, for Gaddafi and for what happened in Libya at Benghazi. Nothing is done to tell the truth. And so this is going to continue with news moguls like Knight of the Equestrian Order Rupert Murdoch and his control of Fox News is going to persist until, well, until it comes to fruition or until God intervenes with the repentance of his Christian people. So all these uh, uh, ducks are sort of lined uh, in a row now. They, they, you know, all the pieces are falling into place as far as uh, this martial law. And I suppose uh, that would also have some sort of linkage with the uh, a collapse of the economy or, or, or some sort of uh, economic event happening maybe not even inside the US but outside uh, as well and perhaps uh, uh, Ukraine is tied into this year so can you make any connection with these uh, with Ukraine and the economy as to what might be coming down the pike well there's no doubt they want to completely devalue the dollar a dollar at least 10 to 1 but they they have to keep the Empire because this is what I call in my book the Pope's 14th, Holy Roman 14th Amendment Corporate Fascist Socialist Communist American Empire as of March 9, 1933 when FDR uh, put forth his Proclamation 2040 and they, then the Congress passed its Emergency Banking Relief Act which did nothing more than to bring the Trading with the Enemy Act inside the country to apply to quote unquote any person within the United States which does not include a private American citizen and that's why I teach my private American citizenship course where you can revert back to that with that private status under section 1 of the 14th Amendment but they want to do this economically and see then this will drive everybody well what are we going to do for money you know what the men are going to do they're going to join the military and that's exactly what the Jesuits want we're going to create economic crisis to create a huge military then we'll have an in-country in detonation. They're going to detonate uh, probably the Capitol in Washington. I mean, that's what Knight of Malta Bruce Willis has depicted in his book, uh, in his movie, uh, uh, Live Free or Die, Live Free or Die, was it? Live Free or Die Hard, something like that. Yeah. And so, uh, so we have these depicted in the Hollywood movies, the detonation of the Capitol building, which is what the Jesuits sought to do with the gunpowder plot in England in 1605. They're going to successfully do that. They're going to, what are they going to do? They're going to probably blame Iran. Because that's why Iran has to have nuclear weapons, right? They have to have nuclear fission. Well, Iran couldn't deliver a weapon to save their souls. And furthermore, there's no such thing as airborne nuclear war. That's not true. There's no such thing as an airborne atomic detonation. It's never happened. I devoted six months of intense study to the topic. It's all bogus. They only detonate on the ground when the sun is in a right harmonic relationship with a device. And if the sun's not in the right harmonic relationship, it's not going to detonate. And There's no such thing as airborne nuclear war. Yeah. So, um, so they're going to do something like that. or they're, Another place they're going to detonate is Los Angeles. And in fact, the government right now has a video on what to do if there's an atomic detonation, specifically in Washington, Los Angeles. It's a government video. So they're going to do these, they're going to do this, and then blame probably one on China, one on Iran. And so now we can launch off and we can fight a huge war to save America. And all the troops going over there are going to be sacrificed. And as far as Ukraine's concerned, the Ukrainian people, for the most part, are very nationalistic. Well, we can't have men that are nationalists in the Pope's New World Order. So what we have to do is we have to get rid of all these Ukrainian nationalists who don't want to be a part of the Russian Empire and who really don't want to be a part of the European Union Empire. So we have to get rid of these nationalists, so we're going to put a, a puppet loyal to Moscow in Kiev to control the Ukraine, and if he's overthrown, well, we'll just put somebody else who's going to do the same. In the meantime, this taking of Crimea is important because it's in the south of the Ukraine, and this is 
this is imperative that the Russian Navy have this so that when war finally erupts in the region that they own, they control the coastline of Crimea. So I don't think they're ever going to leave. They're just going to continue with their Russian fleets there and the Ukraine for the most part has lost Crimea. And in the meantime, then, we have Skull and Bones' John Kerry, who's encouraging the Ukrainians to stand against the Russians and blah, blah, blah. And you have American backing only for the Ukrainians in a future day to be betrayed by this government in Washington controlled by the Pope, just as was done to the Hungarian nationalists in 1956. The Hungarian nationalists wanted the Soviets out. They wanted nothing to do in their country. And so what happened? We have that dirty, filthy Knight of Malta, Alan Dulles, advocating and encouraging the Hungarian men to rise up against the Soviet occupiers, and we're going to help you. At the last minute, the CIA betrays them all. And all those Hungarians are taken as prisoners by the GRU, and they're sent off to the Gulag there in, in Siberia, and most of them die there. They're going to do that. They did the same thing in 1968 in Czechoslovakia with Alexander Dubek. And Dubek said, you know, we don't want to be under Soviet rule anymore. And then what happened? The CIA encourages the Czechs because the Czechs are historically Protestant. Okay? The first people to Auschwitz were Czechs, not Jews. They were Protestant Czechs. And so we're going to encourage these Protestant Czechs to, to revolt against their Soviet occupiers. And so what happens? America betrays them. Russian tanks roll into Prague, arrest the leaders, and many of the men send them off to the Gulag. I say they're going to do the same damnable thing to these dear Ukrainians who all they want is a country for themselves to govern their own people with a unique race, language, and culture with national boundaries. This kind of people cannot be allowed to exist. So the Jesuits control of Putin and the Jesuits control of Obama and really Biden, who's the real president, they are going to crush the Ukraine. So then this also, I guess, is a foreshadowing of uh, because Russia is being demonized and Putin is being portrayed as this uh, real monster, which, uh, you know, they are all monsters in my opinion, but, uh, but that did, uh, suddenly Russia is no longer in that allies you know state anymore they they are being shown as uh, this enmity is sort of being built up and i suppose that will have a, a real war or something like that further on down the road uh, so this is that's the beginning right. of that uh, new cold war you could say that's right this is the beginning of the demonizing of the russian people because before you can mobilize an army to attack another people, you have to get those people to hate that people. And so this is what's happening here now. And I will, I will add that Russia is pretty much united with a common race of whites, a common religion or a common nationality, a common culture. They have common borders. And if you notice the Olympics, um, it was a very nationalistic Olympics that they had portraying Russia and its history and so on. I mean, they couldn't care less about the international community, quote-unquote. They care about Russia. And so this is, a, this is like Hitler in 1936, very nationalistic uh, German Olympics there. And it uh, wasn't long, three years later, the war begins when he invades Poland. So we're seeing that similar things happen here. And it's, uh, Russia is going to be demonized here in the West. And Putin, when no one wants to accept the fact that two Putin is a bohemian grover right along with George Herbert Walker Bush, they all work together. So Putin is uh, in a lot of in the media and uh, in the alternative media that make him out to be a real... Uh, you know, macho man, and he's doing the right thing, and he's standing up to yeah. Obama and all that. So that's all a facade, then. All a facade. All a facade. Mm -hmm. And and uh, he has his anti-sodomite, anti-homosexual policies. Do you think he cares about who's a homosexual or not? It's all to incite the pro-homosexual West against him. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. That that makes that makes uh, more sense because at the top, I would imagine they are all uh, into sodomy. Anyways, that's, that's of course. 
Of course, that movie Eyes Wide Shut made by Night of Malta Stanley Kubrick and the leading character Night of Malta Tom Cruise. That, and that was, that, by the way, that was portrayed in the Rothschild Mansion. And I don't recommend any young people or any women watch that. But all of that's being done all the time, all the leaders of all the different countries, and they couldn't care less about the people that they govern. Now, we want to tie this all together, and what you have mentioned many times uh, in during this broadcast, uh, Eric, has been uh, the Council of Trent, because we want people to understand what it is, like, first of all, that Roman Catholicism is not Christianity, it is actually anti-Christianity, and it is at war with true Christianity, and that war was declared at this Council of Trent. So could you please tell us a little about what this council is and what were some of the doctrines and uh, laws uh, that they passed in that council? Okay, the Council of Trent took place in Trent, Italy. Actually, before you do that, can, can you, uh, sorry to interrupt, but can you just address the question of uh, Catholicism not being Christianity? Because most people are under the impression that it is just uh, a, a sect of Christianity or uh, just like, um, you know, um, a denomination of Christianity. That is not at all true, is it? No, no, no. And the classic work your listener wants to get is Lorraine Botner's uh, Roman Catholicism that completely breaks it down and shows you that it's absolutely not Christianity whatsoever. Hey, but I'll, I'll give you some basics. Is. Sure, go ahead. Pardon? So the, the, the Roman Catholic, true Bible-believing Christianity holds the Bible as its final authority of faith and practice. We're sola scriptura. Therefore, what we believe about God and about His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is found in that book, and namely the Reformation Bible. None of these other phony baloney Bibles that are not based upon Reformation texts, like the text of Receptus in Greek and the and the biblical or the, uh, the Ben Chaim text of the Hebrew text. So they they've used other texts to give us these bogus Bibles, like the NIV and so on. But the Reformation Bible is the final authority for faith and practice. And so therefore, when we read in the Bible, for example, in 1 Timothy what, uh, 2.5, there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Well, that's to the exclusion of the Pope. He's not a mediator. When we see that there's no such thing as the vicar of Christ in the scriptures, then that means that the Pope's a faker. We see in the Bible that the Lord says, I will not give my glory to another. So he's not going to give his jurisdiction, his power to another man. Uh, we read in Matthew what uh, 16 that uh, that uh, he says, "You know, I appear upon this rock; I will build my church." Uh, the con the rock was the confession: "Thou art the Christ, the Son of the Living God." That was the confession that he would build his church. Not Peter. Peter was not the rock. Peter denied the Lord. Peter Peter got into sin in the Book of Galatians, uh, who being legalistic. Peter is no rock. Peter is just a saved man like you or I, if you're born again. So so the Bible teaches that all men are sinners, all men are lost, all men are condemned and all men need to be saved and the, the gospel message is that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried and rose again and when a man truly believes the gospel having repented of his sin because all, all men are called by God commanded to repent Acts 17 verses 30 and 31 when you truly believe that gospel you're saved you're in Christ now and you have the one mediator the Lord Jesus Christ who is your mediator between God and your Heavenly Father and you do not need any church to get to heaven. You don't need any man to get to heaven. You don't have to commit any works to get to heaven. You don't have to perform any sacraments to get to heaven. You're already there. You're seated with Christ in the heavenly as pursuant to Ephesians chapter 1. So Roman Catholicism teaches work salvation. Romans Catholicism teaches what's called participatory salvation. You're going to work and cooperate with God in your salvation. That results in no salvation. And this is one of the doctrines of the Council of Trent. The Council of Trent condemns anybody who believes justification by faith alone. It says, let him be accursed. Uh, the doctrine of uh, Roman Catholicism believes when the priest holds up that little Jesus cookie and he pronounces certain little Latin words, that all of a sudden that little cookie becomes the literal, actual, physical flesh of Jesus Christ and that, that you have to participate in this sacrament of, um, of what, is, what is it called, communion, to be saved. And that's why the Catholics do it every Sunday. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches no such thing as transubstantiation. Transubstantiation is magic. If that priest can actually 
perform what he says he's doing. That's magic. And if you're going to eat that flesh that's now actually been changed into the literal body of Christ, you're now a cannibal. So Roman Catholicism practices magic and cannibalism, which is absolutely forbidden in the scriptures. So what happens is when you have a Roman Catholic tyrant, a Roman Catholic king, a Roman Catholic dictator, he's going to persecute anybody who is going to circulate the scriptures or going to preach it. Or if you have someone that's loyal to the Pope, like Joe Stalin, or the communist leaders, because the Jesuits are the perfectors of communism on their reductions in Paraguay for 150 years. So you're going to have communist leaders, any kind of dictators, any kind of kings, they're going to forbid the reading of the Bible, because when you start reading the Bible, you realize you don't need the Pope. You realize he's a fake. You realize the Christianity of Romanism is not Christianity at all. It's Babylonian mystery religion. And I recommend all your listeners get the book titled, um, titled uh, The Two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. It is unanswered. It's the masterpiece on the topic. He shows you that the cross is a pagan symbol, Easter is pagan, Christmas is pagan, the Pope claiming to, claiming to be the Pontifus Maximus is pagan, he, he, he has triple crown, Lord of Heaven, Lord of Earth, Lord of Hell is all pagan. It all goes back to Nimrod of Babylon. It's Babylonian religion. And in Egypt it was Isis, uh, Osiris, and Horus. In Romanism it's... Uh, it's uh, the false trinity of Rome, the, the, the bogus uh, father, son, and the Virgin Mary, because she's a mediatrix now. So it's all Romanism. It's the false pagan trinity and not the true triune God of the scriptures. So Romanism is totally pagan, and when they have political power, they persecute. They kill those of us who read the Bible. They don't want to circulate in the Bible. So evidenced on that. Remember, Rome had an inquisition that lasted for 600 years. According to my old book written in 1845 or so by Paul Berg, the inquisition killed 68 million people. Uh, Islam is, is, is child's play compared to what Romanism is. So that's why we utterly repudiate it. We want nothing to do with it. It is a cutthroat religion under the guise of being Christian. And history proves it, the doctrines of the Bible prove it, and that's why I call Roman Catholics to truly repent of your sins, believe the gospel, and, and be born again. And after you do that, to come out from among my people and be not a partaker of plagues. Don't participate in Romanism anymore. Leave those institutions, because it's all tyranny. It will destroy your life. It will destroy your family. It will destroy your nationality. It's ultimately going to damn you for not believing in the true gospel. You believed in a priest. You believed in a pope. And there's no salvation outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. So then uh, this uh, Council of Trent, which, uh, or, or even like the Roman canon law, which I suppose is like the, the, the law of the Roman Church by which it governs all its members and uh, desires to govern everybody on this earth. It does not allow for things like freedom of conscience or freedom of thought that we are able to think for ourselves and uh, let our own conscience decide how uh, we are going to conduct our life. They say that they, you need the priest and the Pope to tell you what to believe in and how to believe it. And it, is, and it is for this reason that any nation or peoples that have a culture of freedom of thought and freedom of conscience, as for example in America, it must be destroyed before the Pope, before the pope can, be, uh, can reign supreme. Is that the reason why there is such an attack on the United States? That's correct. Because freedom of conscience is a bulwark of the Protestant Reformation. And when you have freedom of conscience and you have the circulation of the Bible, your country is not going to persecute the Jews. Just like the Netherlands didn't persecute the Jews. And because the official position of Amsterdam was no Jewish persecution in this country, the Jews of Europe flocked to Amsterdam. And Amsterdam conducted more business in a week than the Vatican conducted in a month. Amsterdam became the world's shipping capital. It became fabulously wealthy because it held up the word of God and it did not persecute the Jews. Just like Cromwell, when he established his commonwealth, he allowed the Jews to re-enter London for the first time in over 200 years. Bible-believing men of God do not persecute the Jews. Same way in George Washington. George Washington went to his synagogue in Rhode Island and told the Jews, if you will obey the laws, we will, you will be protected by our laws as anybody else. And as a result, 
the, we have the world's largest Jewish population. We have the most inventive population in the world. We have the highest computer invention and computer chip population in the world because we have about 7 million Jews living in this country. So whenever you have freedom of conscience, you have freedom of invention, freedom of, freedom of thinking new, uh, new things, uh, 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 seeking new arts. When I went down to Disney World last year, there's a place when you go into this new area and it's a big round circle and it shows all these inventions, the microchip and you name it. The vast majority of inventions were, came from white Protestant nations of the Reformation and Jews who were living in those nations. So whenever you have freedom of conscience, you, have, you don't have Jewish persecution, you have the excellence of your country, you have inventing of new inventions like the, ste like the steel hold ship, that's an American Protestant invention, like airplanes, that's an American Protestant invention by two Protestants, uh, the Wright brothers. You have all these wonderful advancements. But when you destroy freedom of conscience, which is what Rome wants, you destroy advancement, you destroy progress, you destroy freedom of thought, and you drive the nations back to poverty and penury as the nations of Europe were during the Dark Ages when the men who controlled the money and the power were the priests and the kings. Therefore, therefore this whole, these wars and these, uh, this whole uh, war on terror, for example, it has been uh, manufactured to uh, to get rid of, of the liberties, not just in the physical sense, but more so even in the mental sense, and that is why the education systems have been uh, have been totally turned upside down. What people are taught and what people are expected to believe in, it is there is no morality in it, and that eventually will lead to the destruction of any nation because when uh, when it becomes a hedonistic nation as for example in the days of Rome then that nation is certainly on a slippery slope downwards uh, and that is what we see happening and that has been uh, basically the history of uh, of all Roman you know countries that were Romanist uh, morality was not the strong suit in those nations was it that's right. Roman Catholic countries are absolutely immoral. That's why they're full of prostitution. Uh, the prostitution run in America, of course, 25 to 30 percent of the population in America is Roman Catholic. But the Roman Catholics run everything, and they run the mafia. And who runs the white slavery and the prostitution in North America? The mob, the Italian Catholic mob, working with the CIA, bringing in the drugs from the Golden Triangle, and, and turning our women into whores and men into pimps and addicting them to drugs. It's all Romanists. And we have to do that. When you do that to a people, that tells you that that people is targeted for destruction and ultimate invasion. They did the same thing to the Chinese with the British, the Jesuits using the British in the opium trade. Weaken those people so the Manchu princes, the last Manchu uh, leader, can be overthrown in 1912. So they're doing the same thing here, and unless there's some sort of repentance among God's people, to really turn to the Lord and to seek to do His will, no matter what the cost, and to meet in prayer seriously every day, God's not going to get involved, and we're going to be given over to our enemies. We're going to go the way of Germany, Rome, Greece, Egypt. It's just going to be the same thing again, and ultimately persecution of the Jews, which will be our complete undoing. Uh, one final uh, point I want to discuss with you, Eric, is do you see any significance in the fact that for a very first time a Jesuit was elected as the Pope? Yes. It was the Jesuit order saying to all of us and all the world, that's right. We run the papacy. What are you going to do about it? In your face and on your case, your move, what are you going to do? So then they must be very confident that uh, a lot of their uh, goals and ambitions which must have been, which have been kept secret for a long time, that they are now ready to be exposed to the world. That's right. And they don't care. Because they have no significant enemy. So yeah, that's true. I guess there is no nation in the world that uh, would, uh, in, in the past, the Jesuit order was expelled from nation after nation after nation, but I think that now is uh, is just a record of history. That is, there's no chance of that happening in the modern times now, is it? There's humanly speaking, no, but God can make it happen in answer to the prayers, the serious 
factual, fervent prayers of his people. And I pray about this every day, every morning. I spend an hour in prayer every day, calling upon the Lord to intervene with someone, someplace, to, to begin to do their duty. And if this, if, if men don't, and I'm not talking about women, I'm talking about men. If men don't get serious in their prayers to God about these matters, we're going to see the death of our wives, our children, our communities, and our country. Well, on that note, I guess uh, that is all our responsibilities, especially that of men, like you said, to rise up and uh, to to uh, humble themselves before the living God who alone has the power to because in the human uh, in a pure from a purely home human perspective the power of these organizations and these people will control all the militaries and all the intelligent apparatuses of the world I mean as, as human beings we have no power against it but of course uh, our Lord Jesus he said that you know I give you power over all the power of the enemy so in the spiritual realm, we have all power. So yes, though we may end up losing our life in this, in this time, our bodies may be killed, but at least we have the assurance that we can have life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So on that note, are you there, Eric? Well, it uh, seems that for some reason uh, I have lost... Uh, Eric has uh, either his call has been dropped or there's been a, a connection has been lost here. But anyways, we were just in the process of finishing up, and uh, I wanted to thank Eric John Phelps for uh, coming on and discussing uh, history in a light that most people would never hear about in universities or colleges or, or no matter how many history courses they take. Okay, his site, Eric's site, is VaticanAssassins.org. It is a wealth of information on there with uh, links uh, to many books that were written in the 18th and 19th centuries in particular and even in the earlier 20th centuries that reveal a lot of this information that has been cleverly hidden from us now in this present time. So with, I will now sign off and I thank you all for joining me today and I'll be back again with another program very soon.
Thank you.